Hello, welcome to OGR's Digital Dialogue Series. I'm Mark McSweeney, the Interim Executive Director and CEO for OGR, and I'll be your MC today. OGR has put together a series of educational sessions to help you and your funeral home recover from COVID-19 and move forward into a new future. Today's session, What's Ahead, a look at what COVID-19 means to your funeral home, will include a panel discussion among some of the industry's thought leaders. We're going to be looking at what changes you can make at your firm to be prepared for this fall and for 2021 ahead. If during today's session you have questions for the panelists, please use the question box to send in questions or comments. Our panelists will be standing by to answer your questions as quickly as possible. Of course, we couldn't do much of what we do without the support and generosity of our partners. And I'd like to specifically thank Matthews Aurora Funeral Solutions for sponsoring today's session. Now let's meet some of our panelists for today's discussion. Charles Castiglia, Lakeside Memorial Funeral Home in New York. Andrew Luce, Heartland Cremation and Burial Society in Missouri. Roger Byers, Byers Funeral Home and Crematory in Florida. And Bill Brock, Vander Platt Funeral Home in New Jersey. We will have one more panelist joining us in a, a little later, but for now, I'd like to ask our four funeral home panelists to tell us a little about, bit about yourselves, your name, your funeral home, where you're from, and for some context, if you could let us know how many COVID-19 deaths you've handled since this broke out in, let's say, March, uh, how, how COVID-19 has impacted your community, uh, maybe tell us how long you've been a member of OGR and how OGR has helped you through the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, let's go ahead and ask you first, Charles, if you'd kick, it, kick that off. Hi, everyone. This is Charles Castilla of Lakeside Memorial Funeral Home in Hamburg, New York, just outside of Buffalo. Um, I've been a member of OGR since 1994 or 5, somewhere in there, past president. Um, and uh, COVID-19, we didn't get hit uh, as severely as New York City did, but we've still handled, uh, we just had our 23rd COVID-related death. Um, the majority of those came in April and the beginning part of May when New York State was at its peak. And uh, it's been a challenge. Uh, the best thing I had working for me is the relationships that I've had through OGR. Um, one of them, Rafi Jose, who's got a funeral home in uh, Manila in the Philippines, they saw the COVID-19 way before we did. And they had some protocols that they shared with a lot of OGR members that we jumped on and used to help us. And even in discussions, some of the early uh, panel discussions that we've had uh, that uh, Nancy Weil has put together, we were able to pick up other ideas that helped us throughout the course of the COVID uh, challenges, especially in protecting our staff and trying to find ways to work around the lack of PPE. Great, thank you, Charles. Andrew Lowe, how about you? Hello, uh, Andrew Lose with Heartland Cremation and Burial Society in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, I am a brand new member of OGR. This I'm just finishing my first year with OGR, and um, we're about we're like we're about the same as Charles. I think we, I think we're at 24, 25 cases. Again, most of those were in uh, came to us in late March, early April, and then um, the rest of uh, rest of them been scattered a couple of months over that time. Um, saw a pretty big increase in mortality during that time. So I imagine we had quite a few cases that uh, that didn't have postmortem um, swabs or tests uh, during that uh, late March, early April. Uh, OG, I had some uh, early on the panels, uh, Nancy did a great job bringing people together. Uh, uh, some of the early protocols were very, very helpful. Uh, being a part of any anywhere where you can learn how to protect yourself early on, and 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 just understanding that the res how some of the PP PPE resources were scarce early on, it wasn't just my uh, lack of uh, readiness was very very helpful. Terrific! Thanks so much, Andrew. Appreciate you joining us. Roger Byers, how about you? Let me unmute here. I am uh, Roger Byers, uh, third generation. We have five locations here in Central Florida. We are approximately 40 to 50 miles northwest of Orlando. Uh, 
one of my uh, client serving communities is the villages, which is a huge retirement community, uh, crossover into three counties. Uh, we have been following the COVID since the beginning and uh, up until recently, uh, quite honestly, have not been affected that much by it, uh, certainly aware of it, uh, have had uh, probably maybe a total of 30 COVID cases. Uh, I've, I've asked my director of operations to give me a number, but uh, uh, well, he just he actually texted me back. So high teens, low 20s, so not even 30. Uh, so for the volume that we do, that, that is very insignificant. Majority of them have been nursing home deaths, um, though nothing like what New York may have experienced. Terrific. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Roger. And uh, Bill Brock from New Jersey, welcome. Uh, can you tell us just a little bit about uh, about you, where you're from, uh, and how that how the COVID-19 deaths have uh, have have impacted you and your funeral home? Bill, it looks like you might be muted. Bill, I think you're muted. Okay, well, I tell you what, while Bill's figuring that one out, let's we, we'll move forward here, and uh, as soon as Bill comes back online, we will uh, we'll turn over to him. There he Let is. me jump right in. Oh, there, Bill, are you with us? I'm unmuted, right? <laughs> there we go. You're unmuted now. Perfect. Okay. So, Bill, uh, introduce yourself, if you would, please. Okay. Again, my name is uh, Bill Brock. Uh, I own the Vander Platt Funeral Home in Wyckoff, New Jersey. We're uh, about 15 miles west northwest of the george washington bridge uh we overlook new york city um i happen to be in florida uh down by roger for the months of january february and part of march and when things started uh, exploding up here uh we came back north uh where we uh were just uh, one firm one location uh, we, uh, norm, a normal month for us is 30 to 35 funerals, families that we serve. Uh, the month of April, we did over a hundred. It was, uh, they were, uh, 16, 18 hour days that, uh, no, was nonstop. And, uh, we had, uh, a long month of April and May started slowing down. We did maybe 50 funerals in May, in, uh, May and the June and July have just quieted right back down where they are supposed to be. That way you, we know that the COVID went south down to Florida, so now Roger can have it down there or it's going west out to Texas and California. So we're happy about that. Terrific. Thank you very much, Bill. As we get into the meat of this, uh, Andrew, I'm going to turn to you first. Uh, how when we're talking about marketing here a little bit, branding that type of thing. How has the pandemic uh, caused you to look at, at at your marketing strategy differently? Thanks. Um, I think to, I think to begin with, it's a it's important that to understand that we're not none of us are are non for profits. You know, we're not benevolent uh, organizations. We do, we do intend every day to be profitable and uh, and pay our folks, pay our bills, pay our mortgages, and improve the lives of the people that work for us, be significant in our community, and uh, continue to have uh, have a have a have a goal of profit. So I think early on, when it came to thinking about a marketing strategy. Um, if the it felt like there needed to be like we needed to retract our message any message that we had out there that was uh that, that spoke to our brand or spoke to something we might be promoting whether it was our whether it was our pre-need program or new location it all felt insignificant the reality is is that the that the 
that our community, the public, it was really turning to us for answers. And so there's a there's an opportunity in in all crises, um, just like changing our marketing um, after 9/11. Meeting, our, meeting the people in our community that we market to where they are in the time of their crisis is super important. Um, and I like, I like to go at everything, thinking everything, thinking of everything from an empathetic design standpoint. Where, where are our customers emotionally and how can we speak to their emotions? Mm-hmm. Whether it's logistics, how many people we can have in your chapel, all the way to fear, uh, are we gonna be able to even do paperwork with touching the same pen um, and having to do this face to face. So, uh, just looking at just looking at, uh, at what what was affecting our community empathetically was a was the first place we started to look at our our marketing strategy. That's how we started to look at it differently. So, with all of that said, then Andrew, what changes did you make, or what changes are you still working on making? Well, we started again. We started to retract some of our some messages that we had. Uh, um, Marketing that we had planned for social media, uh, the way we communicate to to all the greater community, whether whether it's direct mail or the way we spoke to them in phone calls, we kind of started to change to make things a little bit more personal. Uh, we went from form letters to personal letters. Anytime we spoke, anytime we needed to get information out, uh, we just literally grabbed scratch pads and stapled business cards to them. We dropped the formality of what we did. Um, did a lot of uh, made sure that made sure that we signed off with with uh, you know be well uh, take care of yourself uh, use this time to use this time to to um, check in on a family member we really kind of started to be, to kind of decorporate our our look and we, we you know started to kind of go into a little bit of a more folksy folksy message uh, with that uh, once once we realized that that we could move about with a mask and we could start to open up a little bit and have people in um the message really became about uh, about deconstructing our overall offer and communicating in a way that was solution based for our customers so so when it comes to marketing i think we get caught up in in words like peace of mind and and uh you know these big general these big general uh, scoping um slogans and and terms that we use to describe our organization, we got very specific. And and when we would we would uh, talk to customers, we talk about the very specific things that we could do to solve solve those uh, solve solve those problems for them. So when we started to put together those mark marketing, whether it was on social media or the changes we made in our digital marketing or to our my Google business page, we spoke directly to the needs of those customers, like we talked about before, and then empathetic design. Okay, thank you. So, so we're already starting to see some some upticks in in cases around the country. So so now as we're moving forward into whatever this next phase may be, how are you preparing to market the funeral home if there's a, if there is a second wave? Anything we're different? Gonna out, yeah, we're going to go out. We're going to be going to go out with a different message, and we're going to go out with a message of experience. Uh, before it was before it was uh, was. You know, we didn't have an experience. Nobody, nobody had operated in in amongst a a, a worldwide pandemic. So we were, everything we did before in terms of speaking. And when I talk about marketing it, for my company, it goes from first contact to follow up contact to what we put out um, for traditional marketing to the public and how we communicate in our in our public relations program and interacting with the people that can that possibly may refer us, whether that's a a caregiver or a chaplain, or um, um, in most cases, it's it's and for us, it's our past customers and our and the, pe- the people that we've served before. Now it's about going at it with experience, saying, you know, talk speaking as if we know how to handle this, uh, uh, bragging of uh, bragging about how we've tackled some of these technology uh, um, challenges, whether it's arrangements or or limited chapel size. Um, being specific about how we're different in those cases and what they what that means to the safety and to the care. Um, again, we have this wrestle in America of what what we can and can't do. And in in profit businesses, it's very difficult to take a side, whether it's 
licensed jurisdiction or, or, or state or county giving us restrictions. We have to follow those first, but we can't be limited by the constraints of what that language is. We have to be optimistic and give people a chance to feel hopeful in that, in that exchange. And so start to think about the fall. We're starting to think about, again, protecting our profitability by looking at our, looking at, um, how we handle the hospitality part of our business, how we handle the logistic part of our businesses, and how we go forward with, with doing that in a way that technology still keeps us connected so that we're, we're keeping our brand promise. On that topic of connectivity, staying connected, outside of the families that you work with, uh, what about the other caregivers in the community? What, what have you been doing to uh, keep connected with hospice staff, yeah, hospitals, this, et cetera? This one really knocked me on my ass. It was very difficult to, we, we have, a, we have a, a really strong educational component mm -hmm. to our brand promise to the caregivers in our community. We've been, we have been working with them for nearly 20 years in trying to continuously evolve who we are and how we relate to the folks that are in end of life care. Of course, end of life care has changed a lot. We, we've done a lot of seminars and in-service work, face-to-face um, -face marketing, and that really came to a screeching halt. So we just, we were, we were an abject failure at that in the first couple months. Um, and as I kind of watched the, mar the caregiver community start to pull together and be social, uh, Everything from happy, you know, trying to jump in as many of these happy hour Zooms that they were at the end of life community uh, was putting together. Uh, I watched the marketers of the hospices, the, how they marketed their services without being able to call on those customers face to face and start to uh, put our spin on on how that might look for Heartland. And some of that some of that started to work. The most important thing we did is we we kind of quickly ramped up a program that we call the handoff, which is a which is a digital transfer of referrals and communication uh, via text. Uh, so so it wasn't always so formalized on a piece of paper because we were working with remote funeral directors. We were we were shutting down branch locations to keep everybody safe and close. Some of our branch locations were in places where they had common areas where we could absolutely not bring people in. So when it came to when it came to that, we really ramped up the digital part of our our person-to-person uh, -person communication uh, and and created kind of some branded um, materials that it could be li they could be linked to our website to give people information in real time fast uh, without having to you know see these folks fast uh, face to face. As we move forward, we're gonna we're gonna reshape our original program, which was um, medium to large group oriented and educational in nature and bringing that down to some smaller groups and, and some social distance groups. We're gonna hopefully take advantage of the weather in the fall and try to do as many of these types of things outside in places where we can, we've got a, a program that we're working on, we're calling the cremation camp, camp out, which is gonna be kind of a, a s'mores and stadium blanket, uh, um, camp chair, uh, campfire, really spread out and, and uh, where we can start to bring people together and then if, if people, if those same caregivers are interested in tours in any of our facilities, and we can do that, we'll be able to bring those people in in twos and threes rather than fifteens and twenties and doing luncheons like we did before. So, in general, with the you mentioned, obviously the the lack of face to face opportunities or, or the fact that, that just isn't as plentiful as it, as it once was, obviously. So. With some of these other, uh, call them technical changes, media changes you're making, is there, is there any more to that, whether it's with the caregivers, whether it's with other families in the public? Have you, what are the things have you had to change in terms of your social media, your website, all that type of stuff? Yeah, I think the technology piece is the biggest part of what I was, I, I kind of thought I was a little bit on the edge of, of, of cutting edge in, in our community. And I found out that I was, completely ill-prepared to handle the the ceremonial um, piece of what we do, just just webcasting services. And so we, I did, I did the, I took the painful task of interviewing uh, all of the, um, we actually had a, a great panel discussion, OGR panel discussion on the technology opportunities 
that were available to the folks in OGR and others we knew, but based, most of them industry-based. Went through, found the best one that fit for my for my company and, and my and my staff, and then we we went with a we went with a totally cost-free um, uh, program to to uh, to broadcast our our memorial services and our services. We went with that right away. Not innovative, but in how we spoke to, uh, spoke about it to our community was and 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 how open we we were with it, how we integrated it with the. Uh, online tributes that we create. We've been a big believer in creating um, a kind of a digital uh, footprint for the family at no cost, photos, long mm -hmm. uh, life stories, slideshows, and now now a service. Uh, the more And we were actually seeing more people attend um, our online services that we were, than were in person. And um, the um, slideshows that we, that we do for folks up on, the, on, on their website, the, the viewership of them has kind of been off the chart, and I think it's literally people grasping for for um, um, any opportunity to be to interact with that that family that, that they're having their own loss, obviously. Uh, where, where we're going in the future, I'm working with our web folks to create um, some do-it-yourself style stuff. So as we get into the fall, if we go back into you know five you know, ten, uh, 10 people services and, or even a complete shutdown of things go really sideways. Uh, we wanna be able to have a, uh, an inventory of information for folks on the web where we can, we can still be community educators and, and uh, care providers and, and, think, and, and even brief resources. So we're really working hard to create that content and get that in a place that's not just a blog, but um, Nancy, and I, Nancy and I have been working on 10 minute, these 10 minute talks um, where we're going to be able to share that information with uh, our community that talks about stress, talks about mindfulness, and uh, we're so I'm, I'm working with another dig some digital designers to create wraps for that information to have that out on our website and social media. So, you know, it's it feels like it, it feels like a long time since we started this, but it's been in the blip of of development. It's happened very fast, especially since. In the first couple of months, those of us that work in funerals, you know, you have not a second to for developmental time unless you take it for yourself. So I swam upstream for a solid two months. So I'm I'm finally making getting some traction, and hopefully we'll be ready to start to kind of build build on our brand promise going into the fall and be better prepared for it. That's great insight, Bill. Thank you so much. Um, the Andrew did a great job of 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 kind of giving some some great marketing uh, context around what we've deal with past 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 several months. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit here and talk about the staffing side of what all of you are are dealing with. And Charles, I'm going to I'm going to turn to you for for this. Uh, as how did you, uh, Charles, uh, how did the pandemic cause you to look at your your staffing schedule, your staffing needs. How did that, how did that get shook up or change? Well, when everything started happening, especially you know New York, particularly New York City, got right away. I went into panic mode because all I could think of is if I don't protect my staff, or if I don't take this pandemic seriously, and for whatever reason, someone in my staff gets it, passes it around to all my employees. I'm shut down. I'm out of business. I just bought a second mm -hmm. location three years ago, and I'm going, how am I going to pay my bills? Um, so I took it very, 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 very seriously. And a lot of it had to do with, uh, I reached out to OGR friends right away, uh, reached out to Rafi Jose over in, uh, in the Philippines. Um, OGR helped. Uh, he disseminated some things that he was doing for best practices. Um, I also have some consulting firms that I work with. They were starting to pump out best practices. Um, but really, Rafi helped at first because they had already been in the heat of it, and they gave some really solid suggestions. So my one fear was uh, uh, keeping staff safe and protected. So we immediately decided who could work from home and who could work from the office. Uh, Normally, our funeral directors kind of spread out their work, um, uh, but we started having people um, work at 
home, like support staff. Um, we dedicated one person and one person only to doing our care center work. Um, we had uh, um, we had one we had several two and a half of the funeral directors stay home and work from home doing online arrangements and doing Zoom arrangements. Um, we were able to utilize Zoom and we also use uh, Microsoft Teams. So we had a lot of options. So we tried to keep everybody separated. And then immediately before it was even there, even telling people to wear masks, I had everybody wearing masks. We didn't take any chance about that. So when you first started making those changes, was that as early as March? We, yes. You, we hit that right away? Wow. Immediately, okay. immediately. Didn't want to hesitate because my fear was because we just took out a large you know, loan that if we ended mm -hmm. up losing our staff, we were in trouble. Sure. Okay. And and if we and if I let it be business as usual with everybody in the office together, you know, and they spread it to each other, then it was going to be, you know, like brushing a wildfire. Yep. One of the early, um, <clears throat> early and frequent questions, inquiries we were getting here at OGR when this all started happening was relative to to PPE. So. Through that, through your experience, what did you learn about about PPE and keeping your funeral home clean, disinfected, all of that in order to keep everybody safe? Well, in the beginning, we were early, like Bill Brock, you know, in New Jersey. Um, we weren't able to access much of the PPE that now funeral homes are kind of able to. In the beginning, Amazon mm -hmm. would sell to the funeral homes. Um, the suppliers were running out real quick. Um, costs of things started to skyrocket, such as uh, body bags, um, and and the N95 masks quadrupled in price. That if you could even find them and get them, and we started to. I mean, now we're able to get the P, most of the PPE because Amazon opened up the funeral directors as uh, as you know essential care workers um, and first responders in their sense. Also, the um, our state association and the national associations have worked hard on, you know, saying, hey, you got to take care of the funeral homes. But in the beginning, we couldn't get, we just did a large order for gloves because we just redid that. We had a supply of N95s, but not many, so we started rationing those. Um, couldn't find regular masks. Started reaching out to the community through social media and said, hey, we need masks. Anybody know how to make them? And within a week, I had 200 own masks from our community <laughs> kind of ended up being a good publicity thing as well so it worked a couple different <laughs> we were able to protect our staff um yep. i had a funeral home in texas send me 50 uh surgical masks because they knew we were having a hard time getting them said hey we have extra we'll help you out um we had uh um we were low on isolation gowns which is what we use in the care center um, we did have a lot of face shields, so I had to go buy rain ponchos, and we bought full-length rain ponchos for our staff to be able to be safe in the care center. <coughs> New York, in the beginning, New York also was in the beginning telling everybody that you had they wanted you to put the uh, the deceased in a body bag, and they went from I don't know I was maybe spending ten bucks to fifteen dollars a piece, and all of a sudden they're thirty-five, forty dollars a piece. And, you know, we in a short time, we had a lot of funerals for us. And um, so what we did is, and this is going to sound terrible, but we bought a uh, painter's tarp, you know, clear plastic painter's tarp, the thicker mm -hmm. later with rolls of duct tape. And we were basically making our own body bags at that point because they wanted everyone in a body bag going to the crematory or being buried. Um, so that was a state mandate that we had us uh, do. Uh, the one thing that I did learn from another OGR member that really worked well for us, so we realized that one of the biggest problems in the handling of the deceased is that when you're moving the, someone around who is COVID positive, you could potentially expel air from their lungs as you're moving them, bending them, whatever. And uh, Evan Strong out in Calgary, another OGR member, I think he's still on the board, um, he had heard from a friend of his that they were using shower caps. 
So you could buy 100 shower caps for $7, you know, those clear plastic cheapo shower caps, and put them over the face as you're transporting and moving the deceased so that, especially if they were COVID positive. And that actually worked really well. well. Fantastic. So on the front end of, uh, of things, for your workers, where your staff even got to, got there, what protocols did you put in place to ensure that they were, that your staff was coming to work healthy to begin with? So um, right away, immediately, we started them, they had to take their temperature when they came into work. Um, at that point, you know, if they had a temperature, we weren't letting them coming in. If anybody had kind of an issue, we wouldn't let them come in, no matter how they were feeling. We just didn't take any chance. Um, it's evolved over time to now they have to take their temperature every day before they start work and they have to answer a three question questionnaire. Um, have they been exposed to anybody in the last 14 days? Have they um, had any symptoms? And there's a list of the symptoms in the last 14 days and um, have they tested positive? Uh, We've also had, uh, they've opened up the testing in our area. In the beginning, we weren't able to do any of this stuff, but they've opened up the testing. So everybody, if they feel the least bit sick, they, they've called off immediately, even if it's just stomach flu, because the list of uh, the list of symptoms has expanded since the beginning. Uh, they have to go get tested and they're under quarantine until after the test results come back. We also have had every single one of our staff tested for antibodies. Um, and I'm actually really proud to say that not one of my staff has antibodies, which means they never got it in the first place. So we were able to keep everybody safe. Wow, congratulations. So uh, I similarly asked Andrew about you know, the potential of a, of, a, of a second wave of this happening when you, from a staffing side. How are you preparing to, to staff and, and supply your funeral home in the future if there is a second wave? So we've been stocking up. We have a stockpile of N95 masks, face shields now. Um, we're still using the rain ponchos because I bought so many of them, so we're <laughs> good for that. Uh, they just, my, my, the people that work in the care center, our embalming room, don't love them that much because they're really hot, but I'll, because they, they don't breathe. But um, they'd rather be safe than sorry. They actually like them better because they're impermeable. And so they feel safer, actually, believe it or not, wearing rain ponchos than isolation gowns. Um, one other couple things that we've instituted, too, and I forgot to mention this earlier, is um, that we have a disinfecting procedure through the funeral home. So I have maintenance staff. They have to disinfect uh, the funeral homes, both places, in its entirety, uh, in the morning and in the evening. And then... Um, uh, at the beginning and the end of their shift. And then if there's services in the middle, we have our, our greeters and support staff um, constantly disinfecting, wiping down door handles, uh, bathrooms, any surface area where people tend to touch. Um, we have we had to pull food out of the funeral home. New York State said we no longer can have food in the funeral home right now during uh, the COVID-19, which makes a lot of sense. We also bought um, backpack, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a backpack mister. So it's like they use it for um, putting in like bug spray to get rid of mosquitoes and stuff like that. And they fog the area. Mm -hmm. And so we did that and we did our homework on what uh, disinfectants would be the, what we could use as a disinfectant at what uh, solution percentage and have it be the least impactful um, for the safety of our employees. So we actually um, missed our care centers every week uh, and our transport vehicles every week with uh, hydrogen peroxide. Um, you can get that down to we uh, very very expensive pro way to do this. The backpack was about three hundred dollars. The backpack bar was about three hundred dollars, and um, you can buy a bottle of twelve percent hydrogen peroxide. And based on the CDC guidelines, you only need a half a percent to disinfect and it'll kill uh, the coronavirus within three minutes or something like that. So after the hydrogen peroxide breaks down, it's just water and not and, uh, and oxygen. So it's just, it breaks down to next to nothing. So very easy to wipe up afterwards. Uh, and then we're right. doing a month, we're going through the funeral homes and we're fogging everything as well, just as a safety precaution. So that's another thing that's really 
trying to prevent there from even being a second wave. But that that one thing has been something we've been doing regularly now. Yeah. Quick follow-up question that's been asked for you, Charles. It, it, what are uh, what if anything are you able to do to to keep staff practicing safe practices during their uh, personal time away from the funeral home? Well, I'm lucky in the sense is you know we've had we've seen people we've known people that have had coronavirus. Um, uh, we've seen my brother actually had it. My younger brother had it, and he's got some actual uh, lung damage now. He's got some scar tissue mm -hmm. on his lung. And so they're very nervous. I mean, they actually get mad at people who don't wear masks when we're outside. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we we built a culture that's really, really about us treating each other as if we're a family. Um, I mean, this is not pertinent to the question, but this year is our 50th anniversary. And we had all kinds of events scheduled for this year, and we weren't able to do it. We've had to cancel everything because we're limited um, how many people can be at anything. And the employees all got together and they hired a caterer and they bought champagne and they made a big video that everybody was in on the video. And they surprised me with a party in the funeral home. <laughs> so I, I think the fact that we have that family like atmosphere, even though there's 30 employees here, um, they feel like they want to watch each other's back. And um, anybody who hasn't wanted to come into work because they're still concerned, we're not, let, you know, we're not push pressuring anybody to come back to work. The people that are working, um, I've supplied everybody with dozens of masks, um, gloves if they need them for, you know, whatever they're doing, if they're going shopping or whatever the case may be. And they're very, very cautious. And the and they're actually proud of the fact that not any, not one employee has had the antibodies that nobody's gotten it through this whole thing. Wow. That is good news. And congratulations on your 50th uh, anniversary. That's exciting. Thank you. So do you feel, though, that you have, uh, that, that the funeral home has the protocols in place that you need to to keep things running smoothly if a, if a member should, if a staff member should end up testing positive? Yes. Um, we, we opened up our office spaces to have, like, at least 12 feet between each desk. Um, they don't have to wear a mask when they're at the desk because they're so far apart from each other. But if they do get up and walk across the room or, you know, what, or with whichever office that they're in, they do have to wear a mask. Um, they, you know, we're, we're now we're able to get free, more frequent testing with coronavirus. So the minute anybody has any symptoms again, we let them stay home. They go get tested. Two days they have the results. We know where they're at. And I think they're all uh and good with that um if someone does test positive um I'm, I'm confident that with all the protocols that we put in place prior to and with all the disinfecting that we're constantly doing um the chance of it spread between the employees is minimal and that it shouldn't impact us beyond that one employee um, hopefully nobody gets it but i mean potentially anybody can okay how about how about the rest of you uh Andrew, Roger, Bill, how, what are you saying relative to that? Do you feel like you've got what you need in place or r relative to, to staff that may test positive that you've got to deal with? Yeah, this is Roger Byers. Uh, uh, I, I think we're well situated. Uh, early on, we implemented plans in place, uh, went with a, uh, a split of, uh, I think was already mentioned, of our, our staffing. So we had two two totally separate teams uh, trying to keep it divided. So if, if uh, one person or team got uh, infected, we, we weren't totally out of business. Uh, fortunately, we were able to weather that so far and have not uh, had to shut down any of our employees due to COVID. Uh, but supply chain and, and things we got on very early and uh, and while we did not experience uh, high numbers here, we, we treated it as if it were, and perhaps the community did as well initially, and that may be why we had such low numbers to begin with. Yeah, I, 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 to, to, to Bill's point, we, we did the same thing in Kansas City. Uh, we haven't seen, you know, we 
I'm, we, we readied ourselves like we were meant, we were in New York City as well. Um, we looked at our op operation and, and, and our staff isn't big enough to, to set anybody out. Uh, but we did manage to to create kind of a um, a little bit of a mouse maze in our in our building where we don't have to cross over uh, one another, where we can separate our our um, care facility, which is our crematory prep and refrigeration, from our business and our chapel from our ceremony and our business, and we were able to kind of create hallways and doorways and and um, and work even. Even today, we still operate. We still operate that way when we're we're together. Um, transport removal over the top of a dressing table, over the top of an embalming table. We're masked and gloved and gowned, and and so we're we're minimizing that risk. Um, I love the idea of, of a floating employee uh, for the for the catastrophe of of of, the, of an infection in the staff, and and I I if I lose sleep, it's over over someone I love uh, getting getting uh, COVID and, and having a uh, uh, everything from a death to a lifelong um, challenge of health. But uh, just just the stress of when you're when when we're high we're high volume and low staff. So each one of our each one of our staff members represents around 280 to 300 cases a year. So with that, with somebody on a on a prolonged illness everybody would be underwater for a very, very long time. So um, it keeps me up at night for sure. I'm sure. Here so in New for, Jersey. Oh, go ahead, please. I say here in New Jersey, um, my son is sitting here with me also. Uh, and here in New Jersey, we were, uh, if I can say, hit so hard and so fast that uh, we every day we played catch up to find out exactly mm -hmm. what's the best thing to do and how to do it and uh, so on and so forth to that regard. And after all that is said and done, uh, you know, when we talk about spreading our desks out and we wearing our masks and so on and so forth, uh, my son Tim did quite a bit in, of investigative work and found uh, these air scrubbers that were placed in each one of the air handling units throughout the entire building. Uh, so that the, uh, are they called ozone? Uh, they run LED lights and a uh, ionize the air. LED ionizing mm -hmm. the air. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the air is cleaned constantly in the funeral home. So uh, quite honestly, on a regular normal day, you know, we're all in here at uh, eight o'clock in the morning. We're all going home at five o'clock in the afternoon. And um, if, unless we're with a family, we're not wearing masks. We're here together as a, an employee or employee family. Uh, and quite honestly, I live upstairs in the funeral home. So I'm here all the time. Uh, we're, mm -hmm. not, uh, we're not wearing masks as, as employees together. Uh, but these air scrubbers have done a fantastic job. They're expensive, but, uh, you know, from the get-go, uh, when we started off, it was just phenomenal, the amount of cases that we had all at one time. And trying to keep up with that was just uh, a challenge in itself. Thank you. Uh, Charles, you mentioned earlier the uh, you know some of the risks associ associated with having to move uh, bodies that have been affected by the coronavirus. Did did your staff have any issues with being asked to handle coronavirus bodies, removals, embalming, any of that kind of stuff? Any challenges there? At first, I mean, there was so much fear and so little information, and um, I mean, they. Everybody was in a panic, and, and it wasn't just staff. If, you know, mainly I have a lot of uh, support staff. We we do kind of a high service level. Have a lot of different greeters as people are coming in, and a lot of them were elderly. In the beginning, um, they all wanted to just stay home. So those we let them stay home, and it modified what we did for services for families in the beginning um, because we were hit with you know our our call volume increased like 50 percent. Um, those first three months. 
and um, not nearly as bad, obviously, as Bill's, but uh, still significant enough that it, you know, we're doing more work and less people wanted to work. The funeral directors, they felt fairly confident um, because, you know, they've been trained. We, you know, we do OSHA training every year. They understand bloodborne pathogens. They understand aerosolized pathogens. Um, they knew that if we protected ourselves and we did things the way they're supposed to and take universal precautions, that we'll be safe. Uh, the one, one of the older funeral directors, he, he was the one who volunteered to stay home because and work from home. Um, although we still had him doing a lot of arrangements, we weren't doing arrangements face to face. Most of the arrangements still were, were doing a combination of Zoom and teleconferences um, or Microsoft Teams uh, video conferencing to allow them the opportunity to do the majority of the arrangements because our arrangements tend to take a while. They take about three hours, so we can maybe get two and a half hours of the work out of the way online or over a phone conference, and then we only have to meet to finalize some things. Um, but as far as handling the body, the staff felt pr fairly safe. And from the public's perspective, one of the things that we did kind of falls on Andrew's stuff with marketing. Uh, we put all the precautions that we were taking up on our website, and they're still up on our website. And as things change, we modify it every single time. And we literally gained a half a dozen funerals from families who were concerned about how the funeral home was handling the epidemic. And because we laid it all out there on our website, they literally chose us over a funeral home that they've been using for generations because they didn't have any information on how they were handling the epidemic. Bill, Roger, Andrew, anything different you experienced? I think the only thing that I that I would add is that the the mindset of this pandemic um, is it's t it's tough for an entrepreneur, especially in, in what, with what we do, because I I you can't have a sustained fulfilled career in this industry without really loving people and really loving to celebrate people's lives because um, it's tough. And I think we have to think about our own self-care. Uh, I, I, Charles is such a tough guy, but I, I know there were, there were days in early on where we had staff members that would be sitting there with the phone and in tears by the end of the day. And, and, you, and you go home tough, but um, it's, it's great to have each other to, to lean on. Um, and I noticed the tone between funeral directors has really changed. The collegiality is is changed, and I think we're better for it. And I I do hope that we continue to. I know we're not done today, but I but I'm, I'm amongst the, just from marketing and staffing the 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 things that we've mm -hmm. covered so far, these are these are so these are such important things for small businesses. Without without good staff and taking care of our staff and without good marketing, we kind of cease to exist. And so um, I appreciate not only getting to share what I what I believe about marketing, which is my passion, but to but to keep but to hear some everybody talk about how much they care for their staff, and what that means going forward. So I just want to commend everybody for their for for gutting it out along with us. So thank you guys and gals. Yes, thank you. We are, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a uh, about a 10 minute break here or so. Uh, let you uh, stretch, take a bio break, check your messages, do whatever you need to do, and then we're going to come back at five minutes after the hour to continue the conversation, and we'll talk, we're, we'll chat about supply chains, the financial impact and preparedness uh, financially uh, on, on how the pa pandemic has not only hit everybody, but what we can do moving forward, and uh, some of the public health ramifications and, and indicators as well. So. Uh, take a break, stretch, and we will be back at 5 after the hour to continue. Thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. We are going to go ahead and shift gears here a little bit and talk about the financial impact of all of this. So for that, I'm going to turn to Roger Byers of Byers Funeral Home and Crematory. Roger, uh, whether it was the, the 2008 recession, the increase in cremation rates and decreasing revenue, COVID-19, economic shifts have been impacting funeral homes financially in a variety of ways over the past couple of decades. How have you financially set your business up for success to ride these, these waves of change? Well, that's a good question. Obviously, uh, uh, keeping your caseload up, uh, every every call matters. Uh, beyond that uh, simple explanation, I think it's uh, it, you've, you've got to uh, be be concerned and be aware of uh, of uh, where you're at. Collections, I think, are huge. Uh, you know, within the scope of COVID. Uh, we were uh, a business that did apply for the PPP loan, and that took mm -hmm. a lot of the pressure off because uh, while our caseload may not have gone down, uh, we saw a dramatic increase in cremation rates, and we were already high. We were in the high 60% of cremations. Uh, it's now more than that. Uh, direct burials. Uh, Promises of families coming back later to do funerals, which probably in many instances will not materialize. So the revenue stream has certainly been reduced uh, dramatically. And uh, mm -hmm. if you weren't aware that that was happening or going to be happening, you could get yourself called in a real cash flow crunch. Uh, having the PPP loan uh, has certainly helped uh, alleviate those immediate concerns. And uh, that, that was something every one of us, if you hadn't done it, you probably should have gone ahead and thought about doing it, even thinking the, initially that, well, maybe it doesn't really affect our business. Uh, mm -hmm. The reality is it does. It affects every one of us in funeral service. And uh, in Bill's case, he, he not only uh, maintained his case volume, he doubled and sometimes tripled it. Uh, so he had he had the exact uh, reverse problem of probably not having staff uh, to be able to go out and, and fulfill that. I, su I suspect, Bill, you ended up working some 20 hour days. That we <laughs> that we did. That we did. <laughs> so, you know, so, from a financial standpoint, uh, uh, you know, anything and everything else we were doing was put put on the shelf when COVID hit. Uh, mm -hmm. Just good business practices to, to, to maintain and be in place. I'm fortunate enough to be large enough that I have a full-time CFO. Uh, and uh, he, he runs a tight ship, uh, make sure that we uh, uh, get paid from families, uh, uh, where in my grandfather's day, we've all heard the stories, a handshake and a promise. And eventually you probably did get paid. Uh, like Charles, this is our, not 50th year, but our 100th year. And we had a ton of things in place. We did some things in January, uh, but uh, everything else has been put on hold. And uh, so we're gonna have to have uh, maybe a anniversary of 101 years, I'm not sure. but. The opportunity to do a lot of the marketing and planning that we had in place has is, is all been shelved. Uh, it just made no sense to try to move forward with hardly any of that. So sure. uh, that's kind of where we're at. So, so to, to that end then, Roger, the, obviously with, the, with a lot of the COVID-19 related restrictions that were put in place for all businesses, uh, there many reported <clears throat> decreased revenue uh, you know, per service that they're providing. Uh, so the concern is that you know, this is lost revenue for, for 2020. So so how are you addressing this then in your funeral home's operating budget moving forward? Uh, well, certainly it means the owner's probably probably going to uh, have to look at everybody's everybody's pay. But I will say again, the PPP loan has has alleviated a lot of those fears and concerns. Uh, 
it's not that I'm operating uh, with immunity. I'm not. But but mm-hmm. the urgency and needs of concerns of where the cash flow may or may not be coming from is not is not the concern today. So uh, I, I I think you know plans and, and expenditures that may have been in, in, on on the books to do uh, either get downsized or shelved for a little longer or. Uh, you really come to the point where you define your needs versus wants. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes we as funeral directors, I uh, think we go heavy on the wants and not always on the needs. Uh, I, I'm, I know I'm guilty of that at times, but uh, it definitely makes you rethink, you know, how you how you do things and what you do as you move forward. Okay, that makes sense. So what recommendations then would you make for for your fellow OGR members as, as they're looking at their finances in light of, of COVID-19? What would you suggest that they take a look at and consider? Well, uh, I'll, I'll restate what I said. I, I hope that every one of you considered doing the PPP loan. Uh, if you didn't, uh, then I suspect you find yourself in a different mental uh, situation. You, you are... Um, obviously seeing the same decreased revenue streams that that we have experienced uh, with lack of services uh, more cremation i've talked to other people and that seems to be a trend Uh, we're seeing more immediate burials uh, which has never been a big thing for us but we're starting to see that Mm -hmm. and uh, so just you know people are asking for less uh, keep they're they're afraid to be out in public and it steers them towards being a minimalist as it relates to uh, doing services for their loved ones. You know, they, the, the opportunity, uh, you know, and this is my biggest fear to be quite honest is, is that uh, people will get used to not celebrating or remembering uh, their loved one's death in, in a formal public fashion. We fight that already. And uh, this just is uh, exponentially, creating an atmosphere of, you know, is that going to come back? And if it doesn't, mm-hmm. uh, we'll, it may dramatically shift uh, of what we as funeral directors do. I think we have to fight doubly hard to convince people of the value of a funeral. Uh, and that, that in the big picture in the long run, I think is, is, is one of the biggest harms as it relates to funeral service that we face. Yep. Yep. How, uh, how about the rest of you? I know, Roger, you talked about uh, PPP a little bit. And uh, so to the extent that any of you used uh, the CARES Act or other loans, how has that influenced your, your sustainability? This is Charles. Um, we are, we've noticed for the last four months since it all started, our average sale has declined about $1,000 per call. You know, we're a 225 call firm. That could be a sizable hit. Uh, we did apply for the PPP money, which actually got us through the worst part of it because we did have one month where it just everything just we didn't have anything. Um, so it helped gave us some cash flow. The other thing that we did, if anybody has been to have a SBA loan, so when we bought the new funeral home, our loan was SBA backed. Because it was an SBA loan, we just requested for them to forgive it for six months, not defer it and have to pay it in the end. But they they paid the SBA paid the principal and interest for the six months. So I had uh, uh, May or June, July, August, September, October, November, um, where they're paying my mortgage for six months, um, which has been that's actually allowed us to try to sock money away. Um, that we wouldn't normally have been able to to help prepare for when the second wave comes. Mm-hmm. Andrew, Bill, how about you? Uh, I, I, go, Andrew, ahead, Bill. go ahead. Go ahead, Andrew. No, go ahead, Bill. <laughs> um, here, in, you know, you have to remember where I am. I'm in uh, metropolitan New York City. Um, Mm -hmm. the ethnic background is here and people, um, COVID or no COVID 
people wanted to see their loved ones. I mean, uh, the, the state of New Jersey, the uh, chairman of the uh, health commission here in the state of New Jersey said, this is what you're going to do, funeral directors. Um, that body will be moved from the place of death. You will pl place it directly into a body bag. You will bring it back to the funeral home. You'll put it into a sealed casket and you will uh, bury it or you'll place it into a cardboard cremation container and you will cremate it immediately. Um, I, I probably shouldn't say this too loud, be it right, right or wrong. Um, I'm going to tell you that we, uh, uh, we embalmed more than 85% of our COVID cases. Taking all of our universal precautions, we embalmed bodies like there was no tomorrow. And uh, we did cosmetics, we laid bodies out, people came in, they selected caskets. Um, we did a lot of cremation, uh, cremations after that visiting, but we, we didn't have a time of reception, a time of visiting where you're inviting the people into the building two to four, seven to nine. We're inviting the family to come in for an hour. They were happy with that. Uh, we possibly had a priest. Some priests wouldn't come here to the funeral home. Other priests would come to the funeral home. Um, so we had priests come here for prayers. We would go to cemeteries. Now the Archdiocese of Newark, uh, Newark, New Jersey here, the Archdiocese said uh, from the, the beginning, um, going into our cemeteries, and there's 12 of them here in our North Jersey area, uh, there will be a funeral director, a priest, and one family member. Well, uh, that lasted about uh, three or four weeks. And the archdiocese finally said, okay, we'll have a second family member. And then a week later, we had a third family member. And a week later, we were allowed to bring 25 people into the cemetery, which opened things back up again for us. Um, financially, uh, we did apply for PPP, uh, PPE. We received that. Um, and I said to my son from the get-go, I said, at the rate that we're going, we really don't need that, and I don't want to take it from anybody else. But then our uh, uh, accountant came across to us and said, look, they're offering it to you, take it. And we did. So um, I, I can't say that we're doing terribly here as far as finances are concerned. It hasn't hurt us really uh, in the least. Has it slowed down on, on the time of visiting and so forth? Yes, but we were still, we were still doing our uh, embalmings, dressing, casketing, cosmetizing, and uh, we did well with it. Mm -hmm. Were we not supposed to do that? And as I said, maybe I should, shouldn't be telling you guys this. <laughs> as far as the state is concerned, we weren't supposed to be doing it, but we did it anyway because it's what the family wanted. I, I want to piggyback on on what he just said, and and we are certainly in a time of self examination and funeral service. And uh, I I, I want to offer something that's very very unpopular among funeral home owners, and that is the talking about. Uh, we're, it's going to be difficult to, to communicate the value of funerals to our community. It's it, we we are definitely going to have to step back and look at funerals the way they want them, not the way that we want to offer them, because they've already spoken about how they want to celebrate their loved ones. And if we don't rise to the occasion, even in tough times, to accommodate, meet people where they are, they'll forget completely about us. And with the, obsession, with the exception of, of places where there's strong social pressure, um, people have prepaid, they'll forget all about, a, forget about all about the traditions that we have. Uh, it's not about keeping those traditions and what we did. It's about creating new ones for families. And so we should be, we should be challenging ourselves during these times and pulling our team together and, and ha having the guts to talk to our our customers who love us uh, and the ones that don't in a focus group kind of way 
to talk about how are we going to continue in the future to uh, to be the ceremonial part of their the celebrating the end of their loved ones lives. Uh, you know, when I came into the industry, there was a wave of fear that outside event planners might take over this new thing that that families outside of our business called celebration of life. We didn't invent that word. Those words came from from our customers. And we've done a pretty good job of of embracing that. I, I'm a big believer and lover of the the celebrant um, uh, work that's being done in our industry, but it's got to go further than that. And and it's in from a pure marketing standpoint, it is during these times that you have to shift to just like we're talking about in the theme, the shift happens, shift to meet because mm -hmm. when this is over, it will never be over. That's the challenge. We, we keep waiting for us to wake up and for this to, for us, for this to be January. Well, we know in, a, in our, the family we serve, the, the minute we're sitting with someone and they've lost someone, their life has changed. That's their new normal. And this is our new normal too, which I, I hate. It's a whole other subject. But make the shift now and start to create, start to change your business so it will be profitably forever, not just not just for the short term or for in the eventuality that things will be the same because things are never things have never been the same. And this shift has been going on longer than the, the pandemic. All right. Now, I want to jump in there for a second. This is Charles again. Um, you know, the one thing that I've found is that I, I do believe services and families are going to look at things differently on multiple levels, um, just like they are looking at everything that's happening in their lives now in a different way. Um, families are missing each other. I have a daughter who has an autoimmune disease who I can't see very often. I have a mother who's elderly. I talk with her. I am that I'm a that I don't get to see as often. So. Finding ways, we're finding ways to interact with each other in new ways and still maintain that connection. And the more that we were told you can't do something, the more we tried to find ways around it. And the same thing with families and the funerals. I think, you know, in the beginning, when things were at its worst, I mean, I was under one of the same edicts that I'm sure Bill was under. Um, families were not allowed to go to the nursing home or to the hospital to say goodbye to their loved one. Um, my one cousin passed away from COVID in the very beginning. She was the first call I had. And when she, she caught it at work, she goes into the hospital and never, her husband and family never saw her again. And it created this, I almost think that there's kind of a rebound, not so much to get back to where funerals used to be, but this rebound that people do see value in in having the opportunity to say goodbye and it's just got to be done differently and um i mean we did when we were limited to just 10 people at the visitation we were doing zoom visitations we had the 10 immediate family members in the funeral home we hooked up zoom inside the funeral home and we literally had a two-hour visitation with all the family and friends coming in through zoom um they needed that time and they realized they need that connection it's just we got to find a different way to make it happen and that's where the profitability comes in. Amen. Thank you very much. Let me let me uh, shift gears here again, if, if we can, and talk a little bit about the public health side of this. Bill, obviously, you're you've been in the uh, what what many consider the epicenter of, of this thing. What relationships did you have to have with, or did you have with the public health officials or government leaders, and that that uh, helped you stay up to date on everything that was going on? The um, state of New Jersey uh, Funeral Directors Association was extremely helpful. They stayed on top of everything. We uh, got daily reports from them via email as to what was going on, uh, even to the point where, uh, even though I'm only 15 miles from the George Washington Bridge, I am not allowed to go into the city of New York to move remains from the city of New York. I have to call a New York licensed funeral director to do that. Uh, they canceled that for us during COVID, and we were allowed to go over there to uh, New York and move our own bodies. Uh, we had several. 
we had several um, families that were calling us, uh, had phone calls from Brooklyn. Now, Brooklyn, you know, if you know anything about New York City, Brooklyn is an hour and a half drive for me to get to Brooklyn, depending on the traffic. But I had families that were calling here to northern New Jersey because they couldn't find funeral homes in Brooklyn that would serve them. Uh, so we tried to help these people out. I had funeral uh, families from uh, along the Hudson River uh, coming up to us, which is an hour drive up north for them to come up here to us because they couldn't find funeral homes to help them. So um, some of the situations that we were exposed to as far as COVID was concerned and New York City was concerned, um, I've been doing this for 45 years. I've never seen the likes of uh, refrigerated trailers sitting in front of Columbia Presbyterian uh, hospital on Fort Washington Avenue, two of them sitting there, and they were just loaded with bodies. Uh, just tremendous. Uh, something that I, I don't want to be a part of again. Um, the hospitals in New York, if you were not moving uh, bodies within 14 days, they were burying them for you over on City Island. Uh, how they obtain those bodies back I have no idea so it's just uh, I'm glad that we're out of it and I'm glad that uh, I hope I hope we never see it here again so Bill look looking forward what what, what do you think OGR members can be doing now to to form better relationships with their local authorities as the pandemic continues anything proactive they can be doing well as I said um, our state association was tremendous in working, they working more with the uh, state health department and passing along to us. So that that's that would be my recommendation, is that they stay on top of their state associations that uh, would be involved with uh, the state government itself. Can I, this is Charles, can I add something to that question for Please. a second? Sure. Um, I actually ended up uh, having, a, I have a relationship with the county health commissioner from the opiate task force that I sit on her with. And when it came time, even though they were getting a lot of direction from the state, our state association was working very closely with the state, there still was quite a bit that they needed to address uh, locally that they were getting mandates from the state to do. And they really, at that point, they had a couple of funeral directors in the past that they worked with who were no longer in the business and they never brought a funeral director back in. And I ended up filling that role for them. And it really opened their eyes. I mean, to reach out to your communities, to your county level, uh, parish level, if you're in New Orleans, um, commissioners of health, because they really could use the viewpoint of the funeral director on what they had to look at. And just with a few comments, I opened their eyes to some issues that they definitely needed to address. And they were able to address them and be proactive instead of being reactive, getting hit with something before they could get to it. Thank you. Bill, you mentioned before, uh, you know, some of the various things that you were doing during all of this. Um, and things, whether you should have been doing them or not, you continue to do as best as you could. Generally speaking, did, did you get much pushback from families wanting a funeral home to, we'll say, look the other way when it came to safety restrictions or, or families that just, frankly, just ignored the protocols? No, I won't say that uh, they wanted us to look the other way. We, we told them what we were allowed to do and um, we might have pushed the envelope a little bit uh, just to give them as much as we could. Mm -hmm. And does that make sense to you? You know, we weren't yeah. supposed to, yeah. we weren't supposed to have people coming into the funeral home, and we did. Um, we kept the, to uh, you know the minimum uh, 
a limited times, so on and so forth. You know, it was just for family members, but we gave them something that the state told us we couldn't, and we did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Roger, Andrew, Charles, how about you? Yeah, this is Roger. Uh, I'd like to speak to it as well. I, I'll, I'll agree with Bill getting our uh, state association. For me, that was the Independent Funeral Directors of Florida. Uh, and, uh, quickly getting funeral homes recognized as being essential, uh, tying mm -hmm. us in uh, with the governor's office as it relates to uh, uh, priorities. And then on a county level, I, I reached out to emergency management, who I knew the head of that, uh, and through my efforts on behalf of all the funeral providers in, in my county, uh, were able to secure and get PPP uh, uh, equipment, the N95 masks, uh, they actually had them set aside for funeral providers. You had to actually go and be fitted uh, to the, you had to go to them to be fitted. Uh, and that was a very positive thing for, for staff to know that uh, they had they had the, the best mask that was being provided at the time, not just a cloth mask. Um, but working with emergency management, of course, our, our emergency management down here, it may be a little bit more involved uh, just because of all the hurricanes we have yearly. So it's, it's, it's a very dedicated uh, organization within the county structure. And uh, I certainly tapped into that and that was, uh, that was a very positive thing. It's Andrew, we, we, ahead, were, Andrew. Uh, we were fortunate in, in the Kansas City metropolitan area. We have a pretty spectacular um, third party uh, trade um, crematory uh, removal company embalming um, platform. Uh, we do our own transports and cremations, but they, they came pretty quickly to us and they, they dedicated uh, four teams and four vans just for COVID. And we made the decision to, to go ahead and even at that expense, um, they were very fair with the expense, go ahead and let them learn along the way. And, and, and we outsourced that, um, didn't pass those expenses on to our family, figured it was part of the part of what we needed to learn and, and get, get to be a part of up to get, you know, kind of get acclimated with them with our company. Um, um, within in Missouri, uh, the, the state reached out to the highest volume firms as they do, like when they're working on death certificate, state death certificate um, software and that type of thing and, and pulled us together and, and created three or four, I think it was four central areas where they were going to have uh, uh, tents and refrigeration. They actually came and got as far as building the one in St. Louis and a friend of and a colleague of mine's parking lot in St. Louis. Never made it that far in Kansas City. There was enough. There was enough people that committed uh, large uh, storage facilities uh, within within their square footage that they didn't feel like that was necessary. But we were going to be we were going to be the point for Jackson County, uh, which is the the county that city Kansas City is in. Where they were going to do a tented area and and, uh, and refrigerated truck, so we got that far along. That was that's scary to watch those tents go up in anybody's parking lot. Yeah, this is Charles. Um, I think to a degree in the beginning because New York got hit so hard, New York City, and then the next biggest area after New York City was Buffalo, but it wasn't nearly the numbers. In you know in New York State that obviously the New York City had or even New Jersey, um, but interestingly now we're in a situation where we have the lowest numbers we've ever had. Um, our dis infection rate is extremely low, um, and where rest of the par other parts of the country they're seeing a spike. And I'm getting the pushback. In the beginning there was no pushback from customers. They understood. They were nervous. They saw the problem. They saw people dying. They saw the refrigerator trucks in New York City. But now what's happening is we have all these guidelines and there's the reopening is taking its time and families are pushing back now because they want to be able to just do what they want to do and there's so many restrictions in place. So it's kind of like after the fact that we're actually having a lot more trouble with pushback from families. Thank you. Uh, 
I want to talk now, if we could, about a uh, little bit of the supply issues, supply chain issues that, that have been impacting the industry. And I uh, want to say up front, Matt Burson of, uh, from Monarch Resources had intended to join us today, but had an unavoidable issue come up and was unable to do so. Uh, so I'm asking, uh, Nancy Wheel is, is our Director of Member Resources with OGR. And she has been doing, in that capacity, has been uh, talking to a number of our suppliers across the country uh, to get imp input from them on, on how, you know, how business has been impacted in general and, and, and what their service has been like. So Nancy is going to pinch hit for us today on behalf of Matt and talk a little bit about what she has learned from the supply side and how this is impacting funeral homes across country. So, Nancy, from what you've learned in talking to Matt and others, how in general have our suppliers, we know how the funeral homes have been impacted, how have our suppliers been impacted by all of this? I've really found that it has been quite a challenge, as you all can imagine, because you're not getting supplies from them because they're not getting supplies from their um, normal methods of, of getting those things. In one case, we actually had a supply partner who has basically gone out of business, at least for this season, which is the Judith Ross Studio Collection of those calendars you all know that you would order every year. And she absolutely could not get the calendars made and through the supply chain that she was using. And so she decided not to even offer them this year. So it's had an impact from that to the point of also seeing that a lot of our supply partners are having the same issues all of you are at the funeral home. Lots of orders coming in short staff to be able to handle the amount of business that's being sent their way. They're finding that a lot of um, new requests are coming in from people just trying anywhere they can to find supplies. And so they're trying to take care of the customers that they've had, their long-term customers, and balance that with being able to also have things for the, for the new customers. And it's been quite a challenge, I can tell you, as I've spoken to them about that. So from what your conversations with them, what this may be common sense to some and it, and it may not be to everybody though. So what, what has, what's creating these, the, the shortages relative to the, to the supply chain? Um, I'm going to start with a story I was told. And I think this story is probably the far end of the spectrum, but it has stayed with me. And that is from someone that I know who works for a, a very large national hospice chain. And early on in January, her hospice saw what was happening overseas and began to order a lot of PPE in order to protect the staff that they had at the hospices. And I was told that every single order they placed as soon as it hit the West Coast was um, taken by FEMA. So they weren't able to even get what they were ordering. Now that, that's a far end of the spectrum, but it's very scary for those of us who depend upon it to not be able to get it and to see the FEMA says, we're gonna take that and we're gonna distribute it out. And especially for those of us on the call who know that that list of FEMA was really focused on the first responders, the, the healthcare professionals in the hospitals and trying to get them to add funeral professionals to that list of distribution has been a, a real challenge. So a lot of it has to do with where we are sourcing our supplies. And as we all know, we are sourcing most of that overseas. And so um, that's been a real issue to grapple with right now. I think some of it also was the fact that everyone needed supplies at the same time. Everyone was stocking up and that was globally. And most times, you know, it's locally. Someone has had a natural disaster, a hurricane has come through, the fires have come through, something has happened in a region. And instead, this was a global situation. And when everyone around the world begins to order and look for products, at the same time, you're going to have that shortage. And, and mm -hmm. so that has also been a big thing that has happened. And often within OGR, of course, within our members, that we would share amongst each other. So if, if someone had, you know, um, Andrew, I know is over where tornadoes come through. And if God forbid anything ever happened where a tornado would come through and he, and he lost a lot of his supplies, other members would ship him supplies. Well, we don't have that happening right now because our members have had to keep what they have 
so they don't end up short because we are still in the midst of this and we don't know where it's going to hit next. And so this has created a lot of bottlenecking of the flow of, of these products, being able to get from the manufacturer through that middleman of the supply partner and then on to the end point of our funeral homes. Nancy, I have a question for you. Okay. Is that why I got my chair from Wayfair but not my ottoman? <laughs> because you don't have time to put your feet up. You got to be ready to get up and grab that phone when those families are calling you. And Wayfair must have known that. No time to relax for us right now. Yeah. I don't know how you run out of ottoman. You have more, you have more chairs than ottoman, shouldn't you? Or. <laughs> Supply chain. There's more of a need for, yeah. for chairs than there are for ottomans, I think. I guess. Yeah, yeah. It, it is hitting. It's hitting everywhere. We're seeing it in our grocery stores. We're seeing it everywhere of these supply chain issues, and they are somewhat correcting now, but they are not completely corrected yet. So Nancy, I know you've been talking to a lot of suppliers, and again, this may be obvious. But from the ones you're talking to, what are they recommending the funeral homes moving forward, particularly in regard to PPE as they look at the months ahead? Yeah, it's interesting because Matt I had spoken to um, previously, and he made a really relevant point with the families he's, the funeral homes he's working with. And what he said is there's a difference between hoarding and stocking up. The <laughs> funeral homes that are his customers, he's allowing them to place orders to stock up on supplies they need. But he said, if I have a funeral home that used to order very, very small order, and suddenly they call with a huge order, he said, I talk to them and say, you're just trying to hoard. He said, and I need those supplies to make sure I have enough for all of my customers. So here's what I believe would be a reasonable order to meet your needs, to make sure you have supplies, you are stocked up. But he, he really made that point that we need to be aware that it's important that everybody has supplies. And I think we've all seen that when this started, when we saw these shortages start to happen. And there's a difference between making sure you have enough to get you through, even if it's till the end of the year, in case there is a second wave or there is something that changes politically of, of having shipments come over. So we need to know that and we need to balance that against, is it really you becoming almost um, a prepper and wanting to have so much there in case of. And that has really become part of what we have to look at. I, I'll tell you, Mark, I, I seriously, I have lost sleep when this was all going on because knowing um, how badly impacted some of our funeral homes have been with the overrun of COVID cases and a lack of PPE and knowing they need to be safe, knowing they need to be protected. And now it's sort of the mother in me, I guess, that has almost been worrying, thinking, did y'all stock up? Did you all buy stuff now while it's available? Because we are finding more resources right now, and we've been trying to get that information out to all of our members of here's some different you know, resources of where you can get supplies. And I really am hoping that right now is the time when every member should be checking to make sure what is it that you, from toilet paper to N95, what is it you might need between now and the end of the year and getting it now while there is availability? I think that's the biggest yep. thing. So Andrew, Charles, Roger, Bill, what what did you guys do? What resources did you use to locate and purchase the items that you needed, particularly in those early months when things were just completely gone? And, and I, the follow-up to that is, have you changed now kind of to the point Nancy was just making about the fine line between hoarding and just responsibly stocking up. Have you have you changed the amount of inventory that you keep due to, to, to that early experience and on the assumption that we're moving into another spike? Uh, this is Bill. Um, at the at this time and of course during COVID, um, I'm serving as president of the Bergen County Funeral Directors Association, and as I mentioned before i don't know how many of you and maybe your state so state associations are not like the state association in new jersey um but twice 
the State Association of New Jersey uh, handed out PPE, if I can say it that way. We had to pay for it. We had to keep track of it, what we were taking from them. But uh, as the president of Bergen County, I had to make the transfer of the PPE here to my facility and funeral homes were coming here to pick it up and I had to account for it as to where it was going. Um, twice we did that and we also received a, an allotment from the state, New Jersey State Police uh, came here and dropped things off to us. So um, there again, I, I, I asked the question, are we working with our state associations to uh, find out where we can get all this, these things from, and are they helping you? So, so this is Charles. Um, you know, New York City was hit so hard, and the demand was so difficult. There just was no, even our state association worked, they placed orders, they couldn't get the orders delivered. They tried to source from wherever they could, but it was just, in the beginning, Funeral homes were not considered essential to that level. We were part of the essential services, but they never thought of us in the context of the PPP or the PPE and all the other things that we that were necessary for us to continue operation. Um, I will say though, since then, um, our state association was very instrumental in working with Amazon to opening up Amazon's ability to sell protective equipment um, to the funeral industry. And I think the National Funeral Directors Association worked really close with Amazon. And that was that was the big thing. So at this point, am I stocked up? Yes. Am I hoarding? No. Um, we definitely are carrying a higher level of supplies than what we normally would have carried, um, but not an extremely high level. Um, you know, in the beginning, it was so crazy. People were taking toilet paper out of my funeral home. I had to hide it in a different area. Mm hmm I heard stories with other guys with the hand sanitizer. Yep. I think the truth the truth is, um, I don't feel comfortable at all with what we have. Um, it doesn't. It definitely doesn't feel like enough. My dog found a dog toy. Uh, definitely didn't feel like enough. Um, and and we we literally getting boxes. We'll crack open the box and went, oh wow, that's the that's the 409 we ordered in April. It got here July 6th. And so just trying to count on where we are and when it's going to come in is really difficult. We have an abundance, probably a, a horde of some things that we don't know if it's too much because we don't know if the supply will run out again. And we we still we're still waiting on a lot of things. Body bags have been really challenging. Um, it's every, I can't, I've had several orders of those just you get the email back where they're canceled and they say, oh, no, no, you got to talk to our body of that guy. They, they've had enough and they call. Oh, no, we did last week when he called us. So it's, it's kind of a moving target that, I, that feels a little bit like quicksand sometimes. Yep. Yep. And his tarps work. <laughs> <laughs> I have... Uh, one final question for the panel, but as I'm asking that, for those of you who are listening, if you've got any questions for the panel, we've got a couple minutes. If you've got any questions for the panel, please do uh, uh, type those into the question box and we'll try and get those answered. And uh, if we run out of time, we will grab those questions and get them answered afterwards for you. So, but my final question for the, for the four of you is, is all of this going on, everything you, you've experienced these past few months, What's the one takeaway? What's the one thing you've learned after going through the craziness we've gone through the past four months that 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 as a result you're you're gonna do differently moving forward? Mm. Take care of yourself. Um, right. and this is this goes beyond PPE. Uh, mm -hmm. this is Bill. Um, April first. I was moving a COVID body from a home. Uh, I ended up with two um, uh, compression fractures of my lumbar. Uh, after that, I picked up another body, I picked up another body, and I ended up with four compression fractures. Uh, two weeks ago, I had surgery on my back to fix the compression fractures. 
take care of yourself. It's not worth it. Make sure you have enough help to go with you when you go on uh, home removals and the like. Um, a lot to be said about that. I know I'm a little bit probably older than some of you guys, but I still go out. I don't anymore. I stopped. Mm -hmm. I can't do it anymore. But um, take care of yourselves and watch what you're doing. I, I think, Bill, that's right on the money. And, and even a step further, I think there's this emotional drain um, for all of our teams uh, that there's there's a stress level that this is creating that nothing I've ever seen. Maybe our grandparents saw during the Great Depression or during World War II, um, the stress level that's impacting, whether it's the fear of getting it yourself or fear for your family members, um, trying to not be able to serve the families in a way you would prefer to be able to serve them, you know, not have that intimate relationship with the families because maybe you're making arrangements instead of face-to-face, -face, doing it through a phone call or through a, a Zoom meeting. Um, and, and it's stressful on, on our staff. And I think we have to be aware of that. And we've been trying to do whatever we can to, to be encouraging and do some team building. Um, and my, I shouldn't say team building, it's more steam blowing off, um, just to know that we're there to, for each other, but also to try to give ourselves that mental check and that mental health. That's the biggest issue is physical. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I, I, Bart, uh, um, Bill and, uh, and Charles are completely hit the nail on, on the nose, but from a business standpoint, I think what I learned, I definitely, definitely take care of yourself and definitely take care of the people that, that help you stay in business. Those are one and two. Number three for all entrepreneurs is that, is that I think we struggle. I think we struggle to stay focused. We really, there's a, there's such a fear of, of the smallest things um, changing how changing our way of life and changing our business that we sometimes chase a lot of rabbit trails to make sure that we're, um, on top of everything. And, and when we were completely shut down, no, no customers in doing a hundred percent of online arrangements, we were busy, but there was a lot of time to think there was just a, just something, like, you know, cut down on the number of times you went out to eat all the, all the socialization you do, everything else you, everything got quiet. When it got very quiet, you start to focus and, and, um, I, I found myself rebuilding and remaking three, five and 10 year goals for my company that, that they weren't the same as they were a year ago when, when I was, had the pedal smashed through the bottom of the floor. And, um, that's a, that's quite an adjustment. This is Roger. Roger. Uh, yeah. Pro probably the, the, one of the biggest takeaways that's going to continue is uh, with five locations, uh, my location managers uh, and management uh, would, would try to get together, try was the key word, uh, once a week early in the morning before start of the day. Uh, when COVID hit, we quickly discovered Zoom and uh, I'll never go back. It, uh, it Instead of trying to meet once a week with everybody, uh, we meet on Zoom uh, first thing in the morning. Uh, we were doing it daily uh, during the height of COVID. Uh, we're now doing it three times a week. Uh, I include all my funeral directors uh, once a week. Uh, wasn't doing that before. And uh, it has uh, certainly engaged, engaged all of the staff and concerns get discussed uh, on a real-time basis uh, rather than filtering back uh, to 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 me or to the to our operations manager, it it uh, definitely changed the way in which I will go forward. Uh, we're, we will keep that in play. Uh, Bill knows this. I got so so comfortable with it that uh, uh, I got together the group that goes to South Dakota to pheasant hunt and uh, got everybody to attend a couple of Zoom meetings now prior to us going, just just really to talk, do a little bit of what we're doing today. We had conversation, but but just to kind of get everybody together and, and, and uh, talk, it's, these are guys that we have hunted with uh, for many years now, and uh, it, it, it's a great tool 
And prior to COVID, I had maybe done two Zooms in my life. It just wasn't something we did. It was always a face-to-face. I serve on several boards, as many of y'all do, and and uh, Zoom is certainly, or, or go to meeting, whatever it is, is certainly the uh, way in which we conduct business now. And the convenience of not having to leave your facility and drive somewhere and, and sit down is uh, a, a big time saver as well. So uh, that, that one we're definitely going to keep. Yeah. It has created a new world in so many ways, for sure. Well, Charles Castilla, New York, Andrew Los in Missouri, Roger Byers in Florida, Bill Brock in New Jersey, thank you very much. Nancy, thank you for jumping on and helping us out as well. Truly appreciate everyone's insight and your expertise. I wish you every continued success as the year progresses and we move into what we hope will be a relatively more normal 2021. For all of you listening in, thanks again for joining us. If you haven't already, be sure to type your, you know, to let us know if you've got any questions following up on all of this. Uh, if you've attended today's session and registered to receive CE credit, you'll be receiving your certificate of attendance in the next few weeks. So please direct any questions regarding your certificate of attendance to Alyssa uh, Castile here at OGR. Uh, her email address was put on the uh, chat screen. You will be rece receiving a follow-up email, though, with both her contact information as well as a link to a survey on this session. Um, if you'd also take a few minutes then and fill out that survey on today's session, it'll help us better serve, re serve you in the months to come as we develop these series uh, to topics that will be well beyond COVID moving forward. Uh, finally, we hope that you'll be joining us over the next few days for the remaining Digital Dialogue series. Attendance is free for OGR members as a benefit included with your OGR membership. So please spread the word. It's not too late for folks to, to sign up and take part in these. That's it for now. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. Uh, please don't forget to, fit, to fill out the survey, and we hope to see you soon. Take care, everybody. So long. Thank you. Thank you.